talk for about 10 minutes really on some aspects of change, which I hope will be helpful for both today and the next year or two. I think change is an ambiguous experience. Um, it is, to draw on Dickens, both the best of times and the worst of times. And change can have us excited and energised, and at the same time, anxious and fearful. If we would glib about it, we'd say change is part of life and to live is to change. But to be more subtle, maybe it's not change that we resist, but it's been changed by someone else. From my academic work, really, on organisational change, I suggest that conscious, deliberate change involves asking six questions. That's what I want to talk about for these few minutes. And these questions apply as much to an individual wanting to lose weight as to an apostolate framing a future direction. So the first question is the one we always ask is why? Why change? What's wrong with where we are now? That sort of question. And understanding why we might need to change can come from experiences outside of ourselves, such as the demands of a changing world, or it can come from within ourselves, such as the desire for a greater good, or the limitations of current resources or activities. So change can be inspired as much by hopes and desires as much by the challenge of current realities. Research on the problems in this area point to failures to heed objective signals indicating the need for change, or subjective judgments about the scope or the urgency of change, and maybe ambivalence that arises in conversations. The second question is, what do we want things to be like after we've changed? Because without a sense of direction where we want to go by changing, we can be rudderless, have no sense of direction, and really be swamped by our sense of the problems. And it's in a vision of the future that there's life. Because a vision is what creates energy and enthusiasm and purposeful activity. The third question is, what do we need to change to get there? Uh, the sense of direction towards a future that we want provides a lens by which we can examine what it is that we need to change in our present activities, ways of thinking and working, in order to get there. Here we frame the change by putting words on it. The research points to failures in this area to engage people in participating in assessing what needs changing and ignoring how people are ready or not ready to change and not building commitment and alignment. The next question is how do we get there? And I suppose that's where the change actually takes place and actions are taken. But of course, if the previous questions have not been adequately answered, then this process becomes difficult, painful and conflictual, as people become disconnected from what the imperative for change is and where we're going about it. The research in this area points to what might not work well, to difficulties in dealing with new issues that emerge, sometimes unanticipated side effects, emotional responses, resistances, and perhaps inadequate leadership. And the fifth question is, how do we sustain what we've changed? And the crucial question of how we sustain the change and reinforce it, so it becomes our way of proceeding, while at the same time, not closing ourselves to future change, is very often neglected. We can declare victory too soon. The research in this question points to the danger of losing focus and shifting priorities, particularly when key leaders change, or there's passive aggressive resistance, resource starvation, or even just change fatigue. And of course, there may be unpredictable shifts in the outside world. And the sixth question really is, what have we learned that will help us for future change? It is said there could be no change without learning and no learning without change. And so paying attention to our experience of asking these six questions and how we understand, how we come to answers that help us get somewhere, for me is pivotal. Because there's going to be lots of change in the future and we need to carry our learning with us for those occasions. And what might prevent us from such learning? Well, I think essentially it may be in the questions we don't ask 
the questions that are embedded in strategies of self-protection and avoiding embarrassment, rather than the questions that open up what it is we need to know and what would help decision and action. Contemporary theory about changing, whether it's worked through a planned or an emergent process, plays more emphasis now on the quality of conversation. While the former literature used to talk about the, the quality of objective analysis. While such analysis continue to play a role, but the emphasis today is more on how conversation changes how we think about what we do and leads to changing what we do. Conversation whereby we can sit down together and listen to one another as to what our experiences are, how we understand and interpret them, and how shared understanding emerges as the basis for action is at the heart of it all. We may see the world differently, and there are often multiple perspectives on what is real. We may differ in our interpretation of what needs to change and where we want to go. Conversations can take a narrow focus and be unreflective, or can take a broader focus and be reflective. But to engage in such conversation, I think, involves us attending to what goes on inside ourselves, our hopes, our energies, our fears and our anxieties. In short, our consolations and our desolations. And what do we do with that? Ignatius has taught us a lot about this and has taught us a lot about how to converse together about what moves us and what inhibits us from actions. And I think uh, that Ignatian spirituality is a spirituality of change. The exercises are all about change. We're affirmed as loved by God. We accept our sinfulness and our limitations as we learn that we are forgiven. And we're invited to respond to Christ's call to follow him. And in doing so, we seek freedom as we are confronted with our resistances and saved from them as we desire to respond to greater love and service. In the constitutions, we're invited to consider greater good and greater need and to be free to labour in that part of the Lord's vineyard entrusted to us. So to conclude, the six questions in my view are seminal and unavoidable, whether they're tacitly implied or explicitly asked. They ground the essential elements of change. Contemporary changing theory emphasises the quality of conversation as central to how we think about what we do and leads to changing what we do. At the same time, from our Ignatian heritage, there are Ignatian ways of engaging with these questions and in conversations, and to these, I suggest, that we might devote some attention to over the coming months. Am I within my ten minutes? Excellent. I swore I wouldn't go beyond ten minutes. Thank you. All right.